neurologist, as a physician, expects people to come to him with problems, people who are suffering, people who are disabled, people who have complaints. Um, uh, it is extremely unusual, um, for example, to receive, as I mentioned earlier, a letter from someone who describes uh, an achievement, like my lady who said that she had suddenly achieved stereo vision and her life had been wonderfully enlarged. Most of the people who come to me say their life has been diminished or shrunken or affected by whatever it is. But having said that, and, and, and as a physician, um, if the uh, um, if the if the if the disease or problem it can't be treated as such, uh, which, which may be the case. I mean, there may be some forms of brain damage or spinal damage which are there. You have to accept it. Um, but then, uh, then the real challenge is to find other ways of living and making the fullest possible life and identity using, if you want, sort of other parts of the brain and compensating. Um, I mean, I'll give you a specific example. It's, it's easier for me to think in specific terms. Um, I, uh, I, I was consulted by a writer, a novelist, who on one occasion, uh, he had um, had breakfast, he felt fine, he went to get the newspaper outside, in fact, it was the Toronto Globe and Mail, and he found it unintelligible. It clearly was the newspaper, but he couldn't make anything of the print. He had a momentary feeling that the paper was printed in Serbo-Croat or something. And he had what's called a visual alexia. Uh, he'd had a small stroke affecting the visual parts of the brain. And for a writer, above all people, to be suddenly unable to read, interestingly, he was able to write, but he then couldn't read what he had written. And he was devastated by this. Uh, didn't know how he was going to survive as a writer or as a person. Um, um, after a while, it seemed to him that he was learning to read again, that he was re recovering. But in fact, when he was tested, there was no recovery of the visual alexia. And what was happening unconsciously was that his tongue was copying the shapes of letters on his palate. And since the disease only affects the visual, basically he was reading with his tongue. So, so part of my work as a neurologist is to find and help people discover other, other ways of doing things. Tourette syndrome can, um, can make life very difficult for one. But in a sense, there can be another side to it as well, because one's um, one's thoughts are accelerated, one's coordination may be particularly quick, uh, emotions and imagination may be stimulated, and there's a sort of positive side to this in a way to it is a turned on state. And, uh, and, and this can sometimes be, be be utilized. There's some, you know, there's some very good athletes with Tourette's, very good sort of musicians and performers with Tourette's. And perhaps if one sees someone with something like Tourette syndrome, uh, it's good to explore poss possible positive sides of it. And then the person will, you know, um, it's so, um, I don't say there's always a positive side, but, but, but I think it's very important to, to look, uh, not just simply to think in terms of, of defects and problems, but of different ways of doing things in different ways of functioning. And this has now become almost a political thing, so that, say, people with autism will, will you know, like to um, uh, refer sometimes almost contemptuously to the rest of us as neurotypical. Um, so I think the idea of neurological differences and styles is, is very important, uh, although, although, it, although one can go over the top with it. It's a, it, it's a, it's a delicate matter.